once again, from the Legend Tales YouTube channel. Our dearest subscribers and guest, please be advised about the tradition of this channel. We publish two videos a day as following YouTube rules. So some chapters would be published privately but you can always find them on the playlist provided on every video description. Or just click on our created playlist. We try to organize our playlist every day for your convenience but if we fail somehow and in some way. I hope you'll understand. Also, we provide links for the official or professional audiobook and Kindle versions of every book we publish on this channel. So if you are not interested on our way of reading these books, feel free to use our links. Disclosure also provided below. As always, have a great day ahead. Scandal. Bye. Amanda Quick. Chapter 1. The daughter was the key to his vengeance. He had understood that for months now. Through her he would have his revenge on the entire Farringdon clan, for of the four men who owed him for what had happened twenty-three years ago, Broderick Farringdon owed him the most of all. She was the means by which he would regain his birthright and punish the one who had stolen it from him. Simon Augustus Strahan, Earl of Blade, brought the big chestnut stallion to a halt amid a stand of bare elm trees and sat silently staring at the great house. He had not seen St. Clair Hall in twenty-three years but to his brooding eyes it looked much the same as it had the day he had left. The grey light of a late winter sun caused the stone walls of the hall to gleam with the cold sheen of grey marble. The country house was starkly graceful, not a sprawling architectural jumble as so many similar residences were. It had been built in the Palladian style that had been popular in the last century and it had an air of grave and remote dignity. The house was not as massive as some, but there was an unshakable, if chilly, elegance in every line, from the tall, stately windows to the wide staircase that led to the front door. While the house had not changed, the landscape in which it stood definitely had, Simon noted. Gone were the austere aloof vistas of endless green lawn punctuated with the occasional classical fountain. In their place were flower gardens. A great many flower gardens. Somebody had obviously run a mock putting in flower gardens. Even in the middle of winter the softening effect on the house was obvious. In the spring and summer St. Clair Hall's cold grey walls would rise from amid a warm welter of brilliant flowers, cascading vines, and fancifully trimmed hedges. It was ludicrous. The hall had never been a warm, inviting sort of house. It should not be surrounded by bright, cheerful gardens and hedges cut in silly shapes. Simon had a hunch he knew who was to blame for the outrageous landscaping. The chestnut pranced restlessly. The earl absently patted the stallion's neck with a leather-gloved hand. Not long now, lapsing, he muttered to the horse as he tightened the reins. I'll have that lot of Farringdon bastards out soon enough. After twenty-three years, I will finally have my revenge. And the daughter was the key. It was not as if Miss Emily Farringdon was an innocent young chit fresh out of the schoolroom. She was four and twenty years old and, according to his hostess, Lady Gillingham, the young woman was well aware she had precious little chance of contracting a good marriage. There had been veiled references to some sort of scandal in the lady's past, a scandal that had blighted any hope of a respectable alliance. That fact made Emily Farringdon extremely useful. It occurred to Simon that he had spent so many years living amid the strange cultures of the East Indies that he no longer thought quite like an Englishman. Indeed, his friends and acquaintances often accused him of being enigmatic and mysterious. Perhaps it was true. Revenge, for example, was no longer a simple, straightforward concept for him, but rather one involving exquisite care and planning. In the Eastern manner, it required the destruction of an entire family, not just one member of it. A decent English gentleman of noble birth would never have dreamed of using an innocent young woman in his quest for vengeance. But Simon found he had no problem with the notion. None at all. In any event, if the rumors were true, 
the lady was not all that innocent. I see satisfaction settled deep inside Simon as he rode swiftly back toward the country house of his hosts. After twenty-three years of waiting, St. Clair Hall and vengeance were at last within his grasp. Emily Farrington knew she was in love. She had never met the object of her affections but that did not lessen her certainty in the least. She knew from his letters that Mr. S. A. Trahan was a man with whom her soul communicated on a higher plane. He was a paragon among males, an insightful man of refined sensibilities, a man of vision and intelligence, a man of strong character. He was, in short, quite perfect. It was unfortunate that the odds against her ever meeting him, let alone of developing a romantic liaison with him, were infinitely worse than the odds in a game of hazard. Emily sighed, put on her silver-framed spectacles, and pulled S. A. Trahan's letter from the stack of letters, newspapers, and journals that had arrived with the morning post. She had gotten very adept at spotting Trahan's bold, graceful handwriting and his unusual dragon's head seal during the past few months. Her extensive correspondence and wide variety of subscriptions always resulted in a great deal of mail stacked on the huge mahogany desk but she could always spot to S. A. Trahan letter. She used the letter open air with great care so as not to damage the precious seal. Every part of an S. A. Trahan missive was very important and worthy of being stored forever in a special box Emily had bought for the purpose. She was gently breaking the red wax seal when the library door opened and her brother sauntered into the room. Good morning, M. I see you're hard at work, as usual. Don't know how you do it, sister dear. Hello, Charles. Charles Farringdon gave his sister a brief peck on the cheek and then sank gracefully into the chair across from the wide desk. He gave her the careless, engaging smile that was a hallmark of the Farringdon men as he crossed his elegantly clad legs. Course, I don't know what we'd all do if you did not enjoy burying yourself in here and poring over all that nasty, boring correspondence. Emily reluctantly put S. A. Tran's letter down on her desk and unobtrusively placed the latest copy of the, the Gentleman's Magazine over it. Trahan letters were private and personal items, not to be left lying out in the open where they might draw the casual interest of some other member of the family. You appear to be in excellent spirits, she said lightly. I assume you have recovered from the discouragement of your recent gaming losses and plan to return to town soon? She peered at her handsome brother through the round lenses of her spectacles, aware of a familiar mixture of irritation and affection. Emily loved Charles, just as she loved his twin, Devlin, and her easygoing, gregarious father. But there was no getting around the fact that there was a certain strain of irresponsible, devil-maker casualness in the attitudes of the Farringdon men which could be extremely trying at times. Even her beautiful mother, who had died six years ago, had frequently complained of it. Still, Emily had to admit that, with the rather glaring exception of herself, the Farringdons were a handsome bunch. This morning Charles was magnificent as always in his riding clothes. His coat had been cut by Weston. Emily knew that because she had just paid the bill for it. His breeches were perfectly tailored to show off his excellent build and his boots were polished to a high gloss. Emily could almost see her reflection in them. Tall, with hair so fair it looked like gilt in the sun and with eyes as blue as a summer sky. Charles was a typical Farringdon. In addition to the features of a young Adonis, he also had the Farringdon charm. As it happens, I am quite recovered, Charles assured her cheerfully. I leave for London in a few minutes. Fine day for riding. If you have any instructions for Davenport, I'll be happy to convey them. I'm bound to beat the post back to town. Got a wager with Pearson on the matter. In fact, Emily shook her head. No. Nothing for Mr. Davenport today. Perhaps next week when I get the news of the plans for the summer bean crop from my correspondence in Essex and Kent I will make some decisions. Charles wrinkled his handsome nose. Beans.
how can you possibly concern yourself with such things as bean production, Emily? So bloody boring. No more boring than the details of iron manufacture, coal production, and wheat harvests, she retorted. I am surprised you do not exhibit a bit more interest in such matters yourself. Everything you enjoy in life, from your beautiful boots to that fine hunter you bought last month, is a direct result of paying attention to the details of such things as bean production. Charles grinned, held up his hands, palms out, and got to his feet. No more lectures, M. They're even more boring than beans. In any event, the hunter is a spectacular animal. Further help me choose him at Tattersall's and you know father's excellent eye for bloodstock. Yes, but it was an awfully expensive hunter, Charles. Think of the horse as an investment. Charles gave her another quick kiss on the cheek. Well, if there's no news for Davenport, I'm off. See you again when I need a rest from the tables. Emily smiled wistfully up at him. Give my regards to Papa and Devlin. I almost wish I were going up to London with you. Nonsense. You always say you're happiest here in the country where you've got plenty to do all day. Charles strode toward the door. In any event, it's Thursday. You have a meeting of your literary society this afternoon, don't you? You would not want to miss that. No, I suppose not. Goodbye, Charles. Goodbye, M. Emily waited until the library door had closed behind her brother before she lifted the gentleman's magazine off of S. A. Trahan's letter. She smiled with secret pleasure as she began to read the elegant scrawl that covered the fool's cap. My dear Miss Farringdon. I fear this note will be quite short but I pray you will forgive my haste when I tell you why that is the case. The reason is that I will very soon be arriving in your vicinity. I am to be a house guest at the country home of Lord Gillingham, whom I understand to be a neighbour of yours. I trust I am not being overbold when I tell you that I am hopeful you will be so kind as to afford me the opportunity of making your acquaintance in person while I am there. Emily froze in shock. S. A. Trahan was coming to Little Dippington. She could not believe her eyes. Heart racing with excitement, she clutched the letter and reread the opening lines. It was true. He was going to be a guest of the Gillinghams, who had a country villa a short distance away from St. Clair Hall. With trembling fingers Emily carefully put down the letter and forced herself to take several deep breaths in order to control the flood of excitement that was washing over her. It was an excitement shot through with dread. The part of her that had longed to meet her Satran in the flesh was already at war with the part of her that had always feared the encounter. The resulting tension made her feel light-headed. With a desperate attempt to hold fast to her common sense, Emily forced herself to bear in mind that nothing of a romantic nature could possibly come of such a meeting. In fact, she stood to lose the treasured correspondence that had become so important to her these past few months. The terrible risk involved here was that while he was ruralizing in the neighborhood, S. Atrahan might hear some awful hint about the unfortunate incident in her past. His hostess, Lady Gillingham, knew all about that dreadful stain on Emily's reputation, of course. So did everyone else in the vicinity of Little Dippington. It had all happened five years ago and no one talked about it much now, but it was certainly no secret. Emily tried to be realistic. Sooner or later, if S. A. Trahant stayed in the area long enough, someone was bound to mention the incident. Bloody hell, Emily said quite forcefully into the stillness of the library. She winced at the unfeminine words. One of the disadvantages of spending so much time alone here in the great house with only the servants for company was that she had picked up a few bad habits. She was, for example, quite free to curse like a man when she felt like it and she had gotten in the way of doing so. Emily told herself she would have to watch her tongue around S. Atrahan is Atrahan. She was certain a man of his refined sensibilities would find cursing very objectionable in a female. Emily groaned. 
it was going to be very difficult to live up to S.A. Trahan's high standards. With a guilty twin she wondered if she might have misled him a bit about her own degree of refinement and intellect. She jumped to her feet and walked over to stand at the window overlooking the gardens. She honestly did not know whether to be overjoyed or cast into the depths of despair by Trahan's letter. She felt as though she were teetering on a high precipice. S.A. Trahan was coming to Little Dippington. She could not take it in. The possibilities and risks staggered the imagination. He did not say when he would be arriving but it sounded as though he might be here within a short time. A few weeks, perhaps. Or next month. Perhaps she should invent a hasty visit to some distant relative. But Emily did not think she could bear to miss this opportunity, even if it ruined everything. How awful that it should be so terrifying to contemplate a meeting with the man she loved. Bloody hell, Emily said again. And then she realized she was grinning like an idiot even though she felt like crying. The tangle of emotions was almost more than she could stand. She went back to the big desk and looked down at the remainder of S.A. Tran's letter. Thank you for sending along the copy of your latest poem, Thoughts in the Dark Hours Before Dawn. I read it with great interest and I must tell you that I was particularly struck by the lines in which you explore the remarkable similarities between a crack turn and a broken heart. Very affecting. I trust that you will have had a positive response from a publisher by the time you receive this letter. Yours ever. S.A. Trahan. Emily knew then she could not possibly rush off to visit a non-existent relative. Come what may, she could not resist the opportunity of meeting the man who understood her poetry so well and who found her verses very affecting. She carefully refolded S.A. Trahan's letter and slipped it into the bodice of her high-waisted, pale blue morning gown. A glance at the tall clock showed that it was time to get back to work. There was much to be done before she left to meet with the members of the Thursday Afternoon Literary Society. Emily did not find the latest rejection letter from the publisher until she was halfway through the stack of correspondence. She recognized it immediately because she had received a great many others just like it. Mr. Pound, a man of obviously limited intellect and blunted sensitivity, apparently did not find her poetry very affecting. But somehow the news that S.A. Trahan was soon to be in the vicinity softened the blow enormously. Damn, don't understand why you would want to attend a meeting of the local literary society, Blade. Lord Gillingham's shaggy eyebrows rose as he regarded his house guest. He and Simon were standing in the court in front of the Gillingham's villa waiting for the horses to be brought around. I thought it might be amusing. Simon gently slapped his riding crop against his boot. He was getting impatient now that he was within minutes of meeting Miss Emily Farringdon. Amusing? You're an odd one, ain't you, Blade? Expect it's all those years you spent in the East. Don't do to spend too long living among foreigners, I say. Gives a man strange notions. It also provided me with my fortune. Simon reminded him dryly. Well, that's true enough. Gillingham cleared his throat and changed the subject. Told the Mrs. Inglebright you'd be attending. You'll be more than welcome, I imagine, but I should warn you, the society's nothing but a pack of aging spinsters who get together once a week and rhapsodize over a bunch of damn poets. Women are very, very inclined toward that sort of romantic nonsense, you know so I've heard. Nevertheless, I find myself curious to see how country folk are entertaining themselves these days. Suit yourself. I'll ride over to Rose Cottage with you and introduce you, but after that, you're on your own. You won't mind if I don't hang around, will you? Of course not, Simon murmured as a groom led the horses forward. This is my odd notion and I am quite prepared to live with the consequences. Simon vaulted lightly into Lap Seng's saddle and cantered down the drive alongside his host. The anticipation he was feeling was growing stronger, gnawing at his insides. He fought to control it. 
he prided himself on his ironclad self-control. Simon had little doubt of his welcome from the Mrs. Inglebright and the group of poetry reading spinsters. He might not be handsome in the style made popular by Lords Byron, Ashbrook, and others, but he was, after all, an earl. That simple fact, Simon was well aware, combined with his enormous wealth and power, was fully capable of erasing a multitude of defects in a man's physical appearance as well as obliterating a wide variety of assorted sins, lapses in judgment, and various character failings. The ladies of the Thursday Afternoon Literary Society had no doubt been thrilled to learn the Earl of Blade wished to attend their humble salon. Rose Cottage proved to be humble indeed. It was a tiny little house, situated off a short lane not far from the village, surrounded by a tiny little rose garden. Two small, grey-haired women of indeterminate years stood at the gate greeting three other women who had just arrived on foot. They were all bundled up against the cold and worn, aging cloaks and pelisses that were uniformly drab in color. Their old-fashioned bonnets were tied tightly under their chins. Simon surveyed the ladies standing at the gate as he rode up with Lord Gillingham. He got the immediate impression he was about to confront a flock of nervous grey pigeons. He swore softly to himself, wondering which of these dull birds was Emily Farringdon. He experienced an odd sense of dismay and realized he was also somewhat surprised. Somehow, from her letters, he had not pictured her as one of these severe, middle-aged females. He had been expecting a young woman who bristled with brash energy and overindulged romanticism. Five pairs of wary eyes peeped out from under the unfashionable bonnets. Not a one of those gazes appeared to belong to anyone under forty. Frowned. He had been positive Miss Farringdon would be far younger and prettier. The Farringdons were known for their looks as well as their feckless ways. Good afternoon, ladies. Gillingham removed his hat with an air of gallantry and smiled jovially. I have brought along your guest for the afternoon. Allow me to introduce I the Earl of Blade. Just recently returned from the East Indies, you know wants to see what's up in literary circles back here in England. Simon was in the process of removing his curly-brimmed beaver hat, steeling himself for the task ahead, when it suddenly struck him that there was no sign of welcome in any of the five pairs of eyes that confronted him. His own eyes narrowed as Gillingham ran through the introductions. There was no doubt about it. The ladies of the Thursday Afternoon Literary Society were not thrilled to see him. In fact, he could have sworn he saw annoyance and suspicion on their faces. One would almost think the good ladies of the society would prefer he not be there at all. Gillingham quickly finished the formalities. The Mrs. Inglebright, Miss Bracegirdle, Miss Hornsby, and Miss Ostley. The women all responded politely, if unenthusiastically, to the introductions. There was no Miss Farringdon, Simon realized. He could not deny he was relieved but it also complicated the matter. He hoped she was merely late in arriving. Kind of you to join us today, my lord, Miss Bracegirdle, a tall, bony woman with a long face said quite coldly. Yes, indeed, the older of the two Inglebright sisters declared primly. She sounded as if she would much rather he had gone hunting instead. How nice of you to take an interest in our little country society. I fear you will find us quite uninteresting, however. Not at all like the brilliant salons in London. No, no, not at all like London gatherings, Miss Ostley, plump and dowdy, chimed in quickly. We're quite behind the times here, my lord. I have encountered no particularly brilliant literary salons in London, Simon said smoothly, curious at the reception he was receiving something was not as it should be here. Merely a few groups of chattering ladies and dandies who prefer to discuss the latest scandals rather than the latest works of literature. The five women glanced uneasily at each other. The younger Miss Singlebright cleared her throat. As it happens, we occasionally slip into such silly talk ourselves, my lord. 
you know how it is in the country. We look to city folk for the best gossip. Then perhaps I will be able to provide you with some of the latest on dates, Simon retorted, half amused. They were not going to get rid of him that easily. He would leave when he chose. The women glanced at each other, appearing more uncertain and annoyed than ever. At that moment the sound of a horse's hooves clattering down the lane caught everyone's attention. Oh, here comes Miss Farrington now, Miss Hornsby said, showing signs of genuine excitement for the first time. The elusive Miss Farrington, at last Simon glanced over his shoulder to see a dappled grey mare cantering toward the small group. Something went taut in his gut. The first thing he noticed was that the woman on the mare's back was riding astride rather than side saddle. The second thing he realized was that this was certainly no gilt-headed Farringdon. Bright red curls were flying about wildly beneath a jaunty straw bonnet. Something sparkled on the lady's face. Simon was deeply intrigued. Emily Farringdon was wearing a pair of silver-framed spectacles. The sight of them held him riveted for a few seconds. No other woman of his acquaintance would have been caught dead wearing spectacles in public. Miss Emily Farringdon, Lord Gillingham confided in a low whisper. Family's pleasant enough, I suppose, but they're all gamesters, the lot of them. Everyone calls them the flighty, feckless Farringdons, you know. With the exception of Miss Emily, that is. Nice girl. Too bad about the unfortunate incident in her past. Ah, yes. The incident. Simon recalled the gossip he had gently pried out of his hostess. It had been extremely useful information. Although he did not yet have all the details, he knew enough about Emily's past to know he had a powerful tactical advantage in the campaign he was about to launch. He could not take his eyes off Emily Farringdon. He saw with amazement that there were a handful of freckles sprinkled across her small nose. And the eyes behind the sparkling lenses were quite green. Incredibly green. Lord Gillingham coughed discreetly behind his hand. Shouldn't have said anything, he muttered. Happened when she was barely nineteen, poor chit. All in the past. No one mentions it, naturally. Trust you won't, either, sir. Of course not, Simon murmured. Lord Gillingham straightened slightly in the saddle and smiled kindly at Emily. Good afternoon, Miss Emily. Good afternoon, my lord. Lovely day, is it not? Emily brought her mare to a halt and smiled warmly at Gillingham. Are you joining us this afternoon? She started to dismount without assistance. Allow me, Miss Farringdon. Simon was already out of the saddle, tossing the reins to Gillingham. His eyes skimmed quickly, assessingly over Emily as he strode forward. He was still having trouble believing he had run his quarry to earth at last. Every Farringdon he had ever seen had been tall, fair-haired, and inordinately handsome. Looking at Emily now, Simon could only assume that some mischievous fairy had slipped a changeling into the Farringdon nursery twenty-four years ago. Emily even looked a bit like an elf. For starters, this particular Farringdon was no statuesque goddess. She was much too short, very slender, and had no bosom to speak of. Indeed, everything about her appeared to be slight and delicate, from her little tip-tilted nose to the gentle curve of her hip, which was nearly indiscernible beneath the heavy fabric of her old-fashioned, faded riding habit. Sunlight glinted again on the lenses of Emily's spectacles as she turned her head to look down at Simon. He found himself pinned beneath that inquisitive green gaze. It was a gaze that fairly glittered with a curiously refreshing blend of lively intelligence and good-natured innocence. Simon decided in that moment that Miss Emily Farringdon was going to prove anything but dull. A bit unfashionable, obviously, but definitely not dull. She was just like her letters, after all, he thought. The lady was an original. Simon reached up, his hands closing about Emily's small waist. She felt lithe and supple under his fingers. Strong for her size, too. 
and full of feminine vitality. Damnation. He was growing aroused just touching her. Simon frowned and instantly regained control of himself. Gillingham started hasty introductions but Emily was not listening closely. Thank you, sir, she said a bit breathlessly as she started to slide down off the mare. Her attention was on her bulging reticule, which she had attached to the saddle. Blade, did he say? Gracious, we are certainly not in the habit of entertaining earls on Thursday afternoon. My given name is Simon. Simon Augusta Strahan, Simon said deliberately. I believe you know me as S.A. Trahan, Miss Farringdon. Emily Farringdon's mouth dropped open in shock and her large eyes widened in obvious horror behind the lenses of her spectacles. S.A. Trahan? No, you cannot possibly be Mr. Trahan. She jerked backward out of his grasp as if burned. Have a care. Miss Farringdon, Simon snapped as he saw the mare's head come up in sudden alarm. But his warning came too late. Emily's booted foot accidentally struck the rounded belly of the mare. The poor animal took offence at such ill treatment and danced sideways with a nervous movement. The reticule banged against the mare's flanks. Emily's spectacles started to slide off her nose. She tried to push them back in place and struggled to control her mount at the same time. But she was already halfway off the horse and when the mare snorted again and the made another abrupt, sidling movement, Emily began to slide inevitably downward. Good heavens, shrieked Miss Bracegirdle, she's falling off the horse. I say, Lord Gillingham began in obvious concern. One of the Misses Inglebright rushed forward to make a wild grab for the mare's bridle. It was the last straw as far as the mare was concerned. The animal heaved its front half upward, pawing at the air with her hooves. Bloody hell, Emily muttered as she lost her balance completely and fell straight into Simon's waiting arms. As always, the legend tales.